So in terms of the most exciting developments in the world and the space of VTE, I would divide these into uh, a couple different territories. First of all, I think there's gonna be potentially some interesting uh, drug therapies coming down the line. Um, one of them in particular uh, having to do with uh, uh, L uh, factor 11 inhibition. Uh, and it turns out that may be playing a very important role in at least the prevention of venous thromboembolism, particularly around the uh, setting of uh, procedures. Uh, the other is there are several different uh, thrombolytic medications that are in development that have the potential of being potentially more safer or safer rather than TPA um, while uh, retaining the same amount of efficacy. But I'd hold out in terms of the most exciting developments in the world of VTE has to do with our catheter-based therapies. I think we're, we're really truly at the beginning and the dawning of a new age in terms of intervention for pulmonary embolism. And the amount of different devices that are coming out and the, and the uh, utility of those devices is increasing at an extraordinary rate. Um, fortunately, we're also looking forward to several studies that are going to be looking at this to give us a little bit more data about when the appropriate use of these devices um, uh, is to be employed. Uh, but device therapy and catheter-based interventions of pulmonary embolism seems to be uh, here to stay and uh, looks to be a very promising future. Uh, in terms of the devices that are out there, um, this device, uh, the Penumbra device, um, which uh, has, is a suction uh, embolectomy catheter um, that can be quite successful. Uh, the flow retriever device, which is by Anari, which is a 24 French large bore suction uh, device, um, is probably the uh, most popular device right now that's on the market. Um, very reliable, uh, large clot debulking. Procedures can be done safe in very sick patients. Um, also in the VTE space made by Inari is a device known as a clot retriever device that has uh, truly changed the landscape of DVT therapy, um, which has allowed interventionalists to remove uh, both acute and uh, chronic thrombosis from the lower extremities. So uh, this is certainly going to be paving the way in terms of uh, how we handle uh, lower extremity thrombosis. You know, it, there's definitely recognition that in some of the sickest patients uh, that they may end up needing mechanical circulatory support. Um, and I think techniques and tools and experience with uh, ECMO has continued to grow. People have um, uh, recognized where it's appropriately used and how to take care of patients on ECMO in an improved way. So that's an important life-saving therapy in some of our most extreme patients. Um, but, you know, in the last several years, there's also brought a development of several different um, mechanical circulatory support devices for uh, supporting the failed right ventricle, including things like the Impella RP system, as well as um, the Protec Duo cannula, which is a percutaneous uh, right ventricular assist device. And, you know, in some of our sickest PE patients, right ventricular support is uh, sometimes the answer in how to take care of them. I think everyone should be prepared for the uh, you know, recognition that we have long since uh, divided pulmonary emboli into the most massive cases, which is defined by hemodynamic instability, um, submassive cases that were defined by right ventricular dysfunction in the absence of hemodynamic instability, and non-massive cases. Um, but we've moved beyond those recognitions and began dividing them according to the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. Um, into low, intermediate, and high risk, and further subdividing the intermediate group into low risk and high risk. And I think as time has gone on, uh, there's been greater recognition that in the high risk intermediate group that many of these patients um, have morbidity and mortality that's even approaching the highest risk patients. And, and I think in that particular uh, group of patients, we have begun to get, get, to get a little bit more interested in acting more aggressively than simply anticoagulating them alone. And this may have anything to do with um, systemic thrombolytics, catheter-directed thrombolytics, catheter-directed embolectomy devices, um, and sometimes even mechanical circulatory support when those patients uh, uh, begin to become more unstable. Uh, so I, I think, you know, everyone should begin to pay attention to the fact that we are getting better and better at risk stratifying those patients, which is allowing us to then better use some of the tools that have been in development. Uh, the other thing I, I think that is going to be very exciting over the next several years is we have a few really important clinical trials that are coming up that are going to better define 
how we can use some of these therapies that we've developed. We're sort of, we're at a stage now where some of the catheter-based therapies in particular, the practice has uh, accelerated beyond the pace of information and data. But now with these trials coming out, we're gonna better understand where the appropriate use for these particular event interventions are and what the safety is of these interventions. And to name a couple, one is uh, the high pytho trial that's gonna be a randomized controlled trial of catheter-directed thrombolysis versus heparin alone for intermediate risk patients um, who are on the higher end that are enriched with additional risk factors. That's gonna be very important to better define the role for catheter-directed lysis, which, is, which has been in place for a long period of time, but um, the critique has always been that we have not had uh, really large randomized controlled trials that have helped us uh, uh, make decisions about it. Um, there's another uh, device trial that is going to be the Inari flow retriever, which is the uh, embolectomy, catheter-based embolectomy device that's going to be compared head-to-head -head with catheter-directed lysis. So I think that one's going to be very important in terms of understanding, uh, you know, is, is the option better that we remove and suction out clot acutely, um, or rather is there an advantage to giving uh, lytics directly with catheters? and dissolving uh, thrombi, which is a better approach. So that trial is really gonna be quite promising. So I think hopefully within several years, we are going to better understand uh, the layout and when we should use these therapies. Uh, for sure, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has affected physicians from every different background. And uh, for those interested in the uh, venous thromboembolic disease, uh, that's certainly been no exception. I think it, it was certainly recognized early on that COVID-19 appears to be a prothrombotic state. Patients had an unusually high amount of DVTs, pulmonary emboli, um, and some studies even arterial uh, thromboemboli. And that led to a whole lot of uh, hypothesis generation as to why that might be, whether there was a link to the inflammation with the COVID, and really furthermore, how we should be treating our patients. But like everything else in terms of treatment with COVID-19, things are really more complicated than they seemed at the surface. So early on, uh, it became commonplace, certainly in many institutions, to use accelerated doses of DVT prophylaxis. Uh, for prevention of venous thromboembolic disease. Many centers even uh, began instituting empiric therapeutic anticoagulation. So even in the absence of venous thromboembolic disease, putting people on full doses of low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin with the idea being that potentially some of the reason that COVID-19 is able to do its damage is in relation to its promotion of uh, thrombotic events and at the either macro capillary or micro capillary level. However, several important trials came out that challenged the wisdom of empirically therapeutically anticoagulating patients. And, and things began to be a bit more confusing than they seemed on the surface. So there were some trials that suggested that uh, if we anticoagulate patients that are sick enough to be in the hospital, but not sick enough to be in the ICU, that may improve outcomes. Uh, there was another large uh, trial that combined several different trials, actually several different databases and several different trials that suggested that if we anticoagulated ICU patients that there may be more harm than benefit. So there may be more bleeding um, without the uh, uh, improvement in outcomes. So that simply showed us that when it comes to COVID-19 and thrombosis, things are not easy and nobody has a real answer, but most people would probably agree with the following statement in that we would recommend that on any individual patient, you've got to do your best job to weigh the risks and benefits when you're making decisions about therapeutically anticoagulating them. Every patient, unless there's major contraindications, should at least get some type of prophylaxis, um, but probably a limited group of patients should really get true uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. And you know, as to why the trials may have panned out the way they did, nobody totally understands that, but I think like anything else during COVID, it's like taking 20 years of medical information and compounding it into a very short period of time. And during that period of time, things are changing so rapidly, such as at the beginning of any particular trial to the end of that particular trial, um, the way that we're taking, patient, taking care of patients and how we're treating patients is probably changing. And for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know that steroids would, would be helpful for patients. So we weren't using them as routinely as we are now. Now we recognize that steroids might have a mortality benefit. So most patients who are sick enough to be in the hospital are on steroids. That may have changed inflammation. So that may be that once you're already on steroids and the inflammation is lower, 
maybe it's less important for those patients at least to get therapeutic anticoagulation. So that's just a hypothesis I'm mentioning, but it's an example of that practices changing, how we're taking care of the disease is changing. And look, with every different wave and every different variant, um, we're probably seeing slightly different characteristics in the types of patients that are getting sick with COVID and how they're getting sick and how they're manifesting their illness. So uh, in some ways it's been, uh, it's been very interesting, but it's also been very complicated for patients who really think of, for doctors who really think about venous thrombombolic disease to try to figure out how to best take care of a COVID patient when it comes to preventing clot um, and it comes to addressing thrombosis.